Hold on, I have to make me disappear so I can see you. Hold uh, on, let me if I close this. There we go. <laughs> Hello. How Hello. you doing? Hi. Nice to see you, Helen. It's nice to see you too. How are you, Ursula? I'm good. I'm very good, yes. Oh, that's wonderful. Yes, I've heard, uh, I see the harp behind you. I hear the rumors that you're dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of started as a wee joke, you know, because the harp is so not dangerous. It's <laughs> not dangerous at all. Everybody knows the harps aren't dangerous. Oh, so what made you decide to play the harp? Yeah, well, uh, my mom plays harp and my grandfather's, a they, my mom uh, wrote a lot of music, Yeats, set me, Yeats music to, to put poetry to music. And my grandfather's a traditional musician. Oh. And um, there was traditional musicians on my mom's side and slightly more classical on my dad's side of the family. But my mom basically said to me, I've got a flat pack Paraguayan harp and if you string it up, and come with me, I'll give you 60 quid. Oh. Play the gig. <laughs> <laughs> so I strung it up and uh, I'd been working with her for quite a few years anyway. So, and I had an affinity with music and I sat beside her playing the bass and, and picking out harmony and did two and a half hour gig with no practice, not having a clue what I was doing. <laughs> and within a few months I could just play. So it was just, it was just, it was just so natural and easy with me. I've never had a lesson. Um, I could just play it, basically, you know. Uh, you're very lucky but, it coming naturally and everything. Yeah. Well, the thing about the Dangerous Harpist was that I, I didn't really come to play on harp until I could come to it and put my own stamp on it. I didn't want to learn traditional music. It didn't interest me playing traditional music. And I was very severely dyslexic. So classical music, I can't read music. Classical music wasn't going to work. So when I was 25, my whole thing, I started playing the harp, but my whole thing, you know, professional, well, I, I, I didn't even really have a gap. I just went straight into playing it for people and for gigs. But um, the whole thing for me was breaking down the cultural stereotype of the harpist. Like sometimes I'll play into that and I'll play background music and I'll put on the green dress and I'll sit in the corner and I'll play all the all the tunes they expect. And I can, you know, I've been playing for years now. I can I can do that pretty well. Um, but my whole when I came to the harp, it was about songwriting with it, using using it as some musicians would use a guitar to lay down their chord structures and everything. I was using the harp. And then I was also writing really lovely melodies, but writing really violent words or breaking this, shaking up the stereotype. The whole thing has, for me, has been breaking down the stereotype, the harp, and taking it where it doesn't normally go, taking it into performance, taking it out. You know, I did a gig last year where I was strapped to the front of a cura. <laughs> you know, and I wrote 12 people are rowing and I did the fake like a Celtic Jason and the Argonauts <laughs> playing the harp at the front of the car with everyone rowing and um, oh, things you. like that performance you plan it on stilts plan it in yurts and circus tents and theatres and bars and tubes and black taxis burning <laughs> fire escapes <laughs> <laughs> So how many years then have you been playing professionally? I started in 95. Uh, I've been playing self-employed in music in 90, since 1995. And I started in music and I started in the indie scene. I had this whole thing called the Harpist Who's Hip. And it was term with a moderate, you know, a band called Watercress. And we were, we were recording, I was making albums and I was writing songs. It was all songwriting based and music based for the first um really for the first seven or eight years um and that was from 95 uh then in the uh in somewhere in the two th early 2000s I had a child and I had a few years where I wasn't I was oh, the whole time I've been I was doing background music to pay the bills and to fund the albums I was making albums through earning every hundred quid was put away it was all reinvested into into writing songs and making albums 
Um, so all those years I was playing weddings and corporate functions and playing for like royalty and like, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, all the posh hotels or all the people coming in and um, all every venue you can imagine. But I was just, I was basically just playing for, um, you know, a lot, lots and lots of weddings. The stereotypical stuff was funding the breaking down of the stereotype. Yeah. Stuff. And it was earning me, it was earning me my money. So um, then when my son was born, about, when he was about four, I started working, composing for theatre, writing, uh, so like I'd start with a, a beautiful collection of, I'm here in my studio. Oh, uh, beautiful. Yeah, this is, I'll show, do you want me to show you around? Yeah, show me around. This is the, hold on, just unplug this. This is the, the studio. I've got my uh, piano here. I've oh, my, wow. I've so got a play piano. Piano. And what I, I wanted to show you, I have a collection of uh, children's books. So for years, I was sorry, they're all a mess. Oh, <laughs> but okay. that's good. But for years, I was reading my son's stories and I was taking uh, my favorites. I worked a lot with a company in Belfast who predominantly do magic. Mm. Um, hoots. So I composed music for them for about five years. Did, um, you know, touring and playing in flea pits and uh, composed the music for the snail and the whale and the family Hoffman and loads and loads of touring um, in theatre. Uh, I'll show you Belfast. Do you see the cranes? Oh, yes. Oh, it's There's beautiful. There. Samson and Goliath out there. It's a very beautiful day in Belfast. Oh, it is. Uh, Oh, then you've got all our rather uh, colourful political murals down there. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in Belfast, and we've a we'd a color we'd a, it was pretty much it was very very tough growing up in the city. I I did not enjoy it, and uh, um, you can see when you look out and you see all those sort of political murals, you kind of get a flavour of that's east. We're in east at the moment. I grew up in west. Okay, so. so if you don't mind me asking, what was it like growing up? Oh my God, I hate, I hated it. I mean, I, I don't sugarcoat it at all. Um, I think I was quite sensitive and I actually realized now I was quite sensitive to noise. Um, and there was just like shouting and there was, you know, rioting. And when I started going to St. Louise's, it was down the Falls Road, there was like, burning buses and riots and soldier occupation, you know, it was just, it was the, the army were occupying and I, I never understood politics and I still don't understand what the hell is going on. <laughs> <laughs> and, I try to stay as far away from politics as I possibly can. Yeah, well, I just, I think I was just, I had a sense, I had a sort of sensitivity about me that, that it didn't serve me well to grow up in that environment so much. I find it uh, very traumatic and I write a lot about it. And I, I, I wrote, that's how I process my inner emotional world. You know, I wrote a lot of songs about the experience of growing up in Belfast and uh, all that, you know, it was, uh, it was, it was kind of horrible. It was a heavy energy. So we did, the, the, the thing is that we didn't actually realize because I was born in like 1970. So the it started, the troubles had started in 69 and we were down the Falls Road. So, and then we moved slightly out of that area, but I was still going to school right in the thick of it. And it was only when I went to London when I was 14 and I went to London on my own. I was like standing to, for them to search me, going into the shop. <laughs> we're trying to shout through the grid and they're saying like why don't you come in you know I just that are and there was like there's no tanks and no soldiers it's only that it's only when I went outside my own home city that I actually understood what sort of a grim situation we were living in um it was constant bomb threats and just riots happening around you and there was just the thing that struck me was I think I'm quite sensitive to energy and there were days when it was so the energy was so dense and heavy you could cut it it was like chocolate cake you could cut it with a knife it was just it was really heavy dark days and um 
the actual positive side of having lived through something like that is that you do know that when you go through a period of intense darkness that it does come to an end. You can't see the end when you're in it. But here, this city turned into a really stunning city. And, um, you know, now I'm in this filled and vault artist studio. There's 120 artists in this uh, college, Dishes College. Um, we do leave here soon. We're not going to be here for much longer, but I get the space rent pretty cheap. And there's been a very vibrant cultural scene in Belfast and even at the time when the troubles were happening there was some the music and I don't know if you saw a film Good Vibrations yes yeah. very heavy like all that stuff was happening you know there was a lot there was a lot of good um creativity and good people and good energy and good humor yeah. you know my dad he passed away in the summer but he was a very uh humorous he had a very Belfast humour, you know, that's kind of where I get my, when I do comedy, I've been doing comedy the last um, eight years, and that's kind of where I get my, the comedy side from my daddy, and he had a very Belfast sense of humour, you know, it's just about laughing to get you through dark things, and it kind of, it's a coping mechanism, you know. Yeah, I think, um, especially in America, when you mentioned the troubles, um, I think especially Americans, like when your Irish Americans came over and everything, um, they kind of tend to romanticize it for some odd reason. Well, I don't know. I mean, the thing is, it's, I, at, at times, I it was only when I went to London or when I went to England, there was a few times when I got to know sort of people over there or, yeah, I remember going to my friend's house and she lived in Surrey and their local news came on and there was literally a cat stuck up a tree. And me and my friend from Belfast, we, there was two of us from Belfast, we're looking at each other going, is this the news? Is this? <laughs> Is this what you get on your news? I mean, we were laughing. We started to laugh. Like, has no one actually died? Is, is, <laughs> like, is there nothing, does nothing exciting happen? Like, do you just get riots? Like, this is dreadful. There's a cat stuck up a tree. Like, how do you cope? <laughs> your news is so boring. Um, we did, we actually had that attitude. I mean, the thing was, so I suppose it's, it's easy to romanticize it. Yeah, well, I don't romanticize it. It was horrible. Yeah. But it's easier to look back and say when you've when you've come out of it and say oh well I'm grateful I had that experience and some in some level you have to find a way of being grateful for the more difficult experiences of life and I do believe we choose to come into our families we choose our issues which is what we're going to our difficulties and what we're going to work out and I think there's a there's a reason why I was born here and found it difficult to navigate it and went through certain traumas to there was a reason there's a reason there was something I contracted in to learn and to experience yeah I can definitely okay. believe that and music is and I've told this probably a million times I love music because it is so powerful I mean whenever I listen to it or whenever I hear it and I know it's strange to say but it's like there's a certain immortality that you feel like when you're playing it or when you're hearing it it's like there's nothing else that can touch you it's like that flow thing isn't it when you get lost when you forget time and you forget what you're having for dinner or where you where you're meant to be or what should be happening and you get lost in that kind of there it that is like or for example when you get the concept of a song and you start working on it and you're in that vibe and you're in that flow and it, and it, and it makes you cry um and you know you've hit something um it, it's it's so powerful it's so healing it's so moving and it's it's so the best experience of life it is the best way you can live your life it feels so good when you're when you're when you're experiencing that side of it you know yeah to me you play Hey, sorry, do, I, do you play music? Um, yes, I play um, the violin. Um, I'm still learning a little bit, but I pretty much got it down. But um, yeah, I absolutely love it. I mean, to me, it's like 
I know this is a weird way to describe music, but to me, it's like one big wave where it's just coming over, but it doesn't destroy everything. It's like it rebuilds everything, if that makes sense. Yeah, 100%. And have you got to that point where you're composing yet or where you write your own stuff? Um, once in a while, yeah. Um, I also play piano a little bit and I like, um, just like you, I can't read the music, but if I hear it, and my grandmother it. had that same ability. She could hear it and then just replay it. Play them by ear. I mean, the piano is my favorite instrument. I, I just move. Sorry if I'm moving the point. It's just because I keep getting this flash and the internet is unstable. Um, so I was just, I'm going to try and move back here. But um, no, the playing by ear, you, I, I, it's a, I think it's a, it's a different part of your brain and it's, that immersed kind of lost in it feeling is is uh, is is so good. I think it's uh, more concentrative. I don't know. Read, don't read music, so, but I can imagine you're concentrating more when you're. Or it's a different part of the brain, isn't it? So yeah, yeah it's a very creative part of the brain when you're off book. So when did you start um, composing? I, I was three when I wrote my first song, and it, yeah, it was on the piano and. Uh, I, I was playing the piano from I could reach it and yeah and uh, my first song was for my mom and dad uh, I've been long enough with you <laughs> I, was, I was always packing my wee red suitcase and wanting to leave home um, I was always running away but I, I used to sing make wee songs up and sing them but uh, then I played piano all through my, my, wrote a lot of songs when I was a teen, but I never did anything with any of those songs. And then my mum was making an album in the 80s of WB Yeats music, and she asked me to compose two songs for it. Okay. So I set the two poems to music and recorded them in the studio, and that was the, the first love of recording for making albums. And then I took a break. I was more into theatre and circus. I joined the circus when I was 14. Oh. Yeah, so there was a community circus. A guy came from Australia, Mike Maloney, and he's, he, he came to this troubled area, you know, and he said, look, there's more to life than this. And he started a cir community circus. So I spent three years with them. And then I was over in London and I and I then I did a horse drawn theatre company for three years in the 90s where it was mask work. It was they were based in England. And then I came back to Ireland in 1995 and started the harp. So uh, before then, I always I always knew I had the music in my fingertips. It was in my head. It was in my fingertips. And uh, I just hadn't I needed to come to it when I was strong enough to put my own stamp on it and not go through the traditional route or the classical route, which are the two routes that are kind of available. Um, and uh, I started breaking the mold. Oh, well, so what was the circus like? Was it everything you imagined? <laughs> oh, God, yeah, well, that was a community circus. So we were still based in Belfast and coming home. And uh, we did do two weeks at the, and we slept in the toilets in Newcastle, <laughs> in, the, in the public toilets. <laughs> it was literally rough. And I mean, this was, and it was also, we were doing circus around Northern Ireland in the Troubles. Like, we were getting stopped by the army. We were, like, getting our unicycle it was one day we went out to do it went out to do a, a circus parade on stilts and a riot started I got a brick in the head you know <laughs> it was just like there and someone was dragging me up the street and the, and the stilts still on it was like it was really nuts when you think back it was really nuts so um but the thing about it was that it was a very oppressive city to live in like you could get beat up for wearing colorful clothes do you know what I mean it was just it was a very oppressive place um and then all of a sudden I met all these bohemian people and I became vegetarian and I was wearing colorful clothes and I was just like you know it just felt um it it just felt ah, I find I found my tribe um, I was no good at circus. I haven't got like a bendy body that's, you know, fit for tra trapeze. I also kind of hurting myself or whatever when I tried to do it. But I enjoyed the people and I enjoyed the vibe and I enjoyed the bohemian. I knew from then that that's me. This is this is my, this is my tribe and this is my lifestyle. 
um it just every cell in my body everything resonated like whoa this is this is exciting you know I was passionate about it and I went away again with the circus when I was in my 40s I joined a company called Tumble Circus and we toured for three years I was basically playing harp and for the did the whole soundtrack for the the it was like a comedy circus oh okay funny funny material we went to Australia and France and stuff we used to tour with the shows we'd written a show and um so it was three years doing that uh, as well and then when I come out of that I've the last eight years or nine years I don't know how long um since 2012 I've predominantly been in comedy um so uh it's more about getting the audience to laugh <laughs> So what made you decide to take the comedy tour? And turn it up? was an accident. I had written this song because I had always written funny songs and serious songs. Uh, but I had written this song, It Does Not Rock. And uh, it's fun. Like I just, I uploaded a video to YouTube and then a friend, Christopher Flack, um, posted it to the Irish Comedy Awards. And then they wrote to me and asked me to come down and play. So I went down to play it and won, won it, won the Irish Comedy Award. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm like a comedian now. <laughs> so I wrote a break of other songs. I, I, I wrote about nine other comedy songs. And then I went off um, to Edinburgh Festival and got nominated for the Malcolm Hardy Award. So when I, I was just, I was straight in winning with, with awards. And I just thought, okay, I'll do this. But actually... I had always uh, had an, it's my dad, the dad, my, the connection with my dad was humor and comedy, you know? Yeah. So it was that, that it was always in me. It, it, it was always part of me. Uh, it was just finding a way to, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, finding a way to do it. Just gonna get a wee drink of water here. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Well, are you? Um, have you ever been to America? Uh huh. I went on tour. Um, God, it was ninety in the nineties. Uh, I went to New York, Long Island, Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. Boston. That was it. One one trip, and we did all that. No, I went twice. <coughs> I went over with a, delic a group of delegates from Northern Ireland. I was the only person doing music. I was so out of my depth. <laughs> and a corporate kind of conference thing with 500 business people flying from Ireland to America. <clears throat> wow. And I was to do the music and I was terrified. I got to the airport and I wanted to run away. There was politicians and was, I really wanted to run away. And then I had the best time. Really good time, yeah. It was fun. We made friends. We went shopping. We we just I played the music. It was great. I really really enjoyed myself. Oh, so, that's wonderful. But the the other the other was more of a creative tour. I think I find that harder because I get quite overwhelmed in a big city. Um, New York was I was sort of felt a bit on my own. I couldn't work it out. Um, it was very hot and uh, I was a bit lost. Actually, I didn't know where I was going find it quite stressful. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just wasn't, uh, I wasn't, you see, the, the, the reason why I enjoyed the other one was I was well organized. Like someone came and took me and put me where I was meant to be, wiped me up and I did what I was meant to do. But the, the, the next tour wasn't very well organized. I, I, I didn't really fare very well because I just couldn't, I couldn't work. I did manage to make all my gigs and do everything I was meant to do, but it was just more stressful and I had no clue what was going on. So, um, yeah, but I, I loved it and I would love to go back. I mean, it's hard traveling with the harp because it's big, uh, but I do think, <clears throat> not so sure my comedy stuff would go down so well in America, uh, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. And I'm not even so sure my comedy stuff, you know, like it's hard coming out of the last few years. The world seems to be much more, um, it's difficult to get away with stuff. And then if you don't hold the mainstream news's opinion, it's actually much more challenging to challenge things. You're not really allowed. 
Yeah. So I'm struggling finding that because that's what comedy is and should be and always has been for me. But I don't know now, I'm finding it, uh, don't know quite. And I've been playing with it since I've been back on stage. <clears throat> I've been playing with pushing a few, taking it, taking some things to the edge and like, yeah, it was okay. And people, people were very, it's about how you do it. You know, yeah. it's, about, it's about how, how you challenge. Um, but it's quite alarming. The whole censorship thing and all that is, it's, that's dreadful. Yeah. You know? I'm a, a very free speech kind of person. I'm a, yeah. one of those that that very much, you know, I might not always agree with someone, but I do believe in in free You're speech. Like to say it, yeah. yeah. And and that's you know the nice thing like about the arts, about comedy, about music, and everything else. Um, you can push those boundaries, or show things, or hear things, and and everything else, and it in a way it's so freeing because it makes you forget about everything else that's going on out there or at least gives you another side to everything yeah yeah uh it's it's so healthy to have a balanced yeah you know up to, to allow the existence of other people people's right to think or uh you know make their own choices and stuff it's kind of basic stuff isn't it <laughs> um i was wondering um since you play the harp um i know for you it was easy but for somebody else getting started is it difficult learning the strings or is it pretty no, I mean the 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 thing about the harp is the strings are really easy. So you've you've got a um, you've got a scale without the black notes there. Ah. So you put it in the key, and away you go. Start with whatever's in your head. Three blind mice and work upwards. You know, <laughs> like um, if if you can play piano by ear, you can play you can play harp by ear. Now, where it's way more difficult than that is you've got to tune it and then you've got to put it in the right key. Um, and that, that is where you get into what is difficult about the heart. But once you've cracked the code for what is happening here and you've learned how to tune it and you can get a little tuner and it tells you when you hit the green line. But it's that stuff that it's OK when you're sitting in the house and you're playing and you get it to a certain point. But when you start gigging and you go out, you need to know how to tune your harp and you need to know how to get it in the right key. Um, so it's just putting the hours in of playing, basically. I was very fortunate that I put millions and millions and millions of hours into my craft um, and I was getting paid for it. So I was, I was able to reinvest that money. So um, my, and all my, my earnings are live performance uh all my income is live so it's but that's been a lot that's a lot of graft over 27 years um so uh but it's it's the the technical side of it that is the learning you know and the only way to get over it is to get one and start working it out uh, people ask me every day of the week will i teach and i just will not teach <laughs> I didn't learn. I didn't learn. I'm like, I feel like it was just like, why can you not? What, you just do it. Like, what do you, <laughs> do you want? What, what do you want? What do you want? What do you want me to teach you? <laughs> Definitely tell you how to work this out. But like, that's boring. You know what I mean? <laughs> the fun part is the playing. Yeah. Once you get it all tuned up, yeah. Yeah, I remember when I was first learning how to turn uh, tune my. Uh, fiddle yeah that was uh that was something else but um, that, would, that would stand you in good stead because if you continue your fiddle you're you know that that's the same concept this is a paraguayan heart but their their guitar tuning heads the same as your fiddle would have okay so you know how to tune the harp that part's no problem if you can tune a fiddle you can tune that harp okay uh, it's then it's just working out the keys and if you knew if you know your key chords from the piano you'd start to work it out quite quickly 
and it's actually really good to work it out for yourself like I did that and it's you might invent your own language your own way of doing it but it's actually really really you really learn properly when you work it out from for yourself like you you understand you don't just learn it you understand it yeah <laughs> you get it yeah there are I found you know not that having a teacher or something isn't good but sometimes figuring stuff out on your own and learning is like the best teacher ever yeah it's it's because for me um it's the brain neural pathways and stuff once you've learned something you've encoded that or knock that down as a as a go-to but when you come to an instrument blown open you can invent you can create I couldn't have done what I was doing the whole thing with the dangerous harpist and all the, the way I've come to it I couldn't do all that from the premise of having a grounding in lessons because that would grind in oh your thumbs have to be up straight and your back you know you have to do it in this way whereas I came to it it's an open book and I was able to break down the stereotypes through having the bit the blank page and and using it as a mode of expression and in, investigating all, all the options and it's left me to play in a lot of fields and also to keep to keep it fresh and to keep it growing you know I'm ready for a lesson I'm ready to start learning I've, once I start getting like bored with this, which is taking twenty seven years, I can I can then go okay, I'll learn something now. Mm -hmm. Um, so you know, I'm ready to start. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, a lot of your work. Um, do you uh, work with a band or do you prefer solo? Solo. I, I over the years I have worked with bands and I love all those theatre shows that I wrote at different lineups and different content and different signs and yeah and I worked I love traveling with the bands because back in the 90s when I was traveling to America and all I was with this band Watercrest and then I would play before they came on stage and then they would join me sometimes you know uh so it was or I, or I could you know join in with people I've, I've been in other people's bands um I've, I've I've you know I've but I'm mostly especially it's making it work financially and the last tour I did with the band was in 2002 my album Spell and uh or 2001 and it, it was too hard to pay it. I like when I came out of that tour. It took me a year to work off the debt. Oh wow! Um, so it, it because you're paying for four people, petrol, accommodation, food, and even if money's coming in, you the the van breaks down or jeez, uh, I, I I don't know how people do it. Yeah. So I haven't heard. I I just after that tour, I come off and went. It took me a year to pay it off. Uh, not bother you know I'll I'll tour my own because I can still I'm experienced enough enough now and I know audience as well enough to be able to hold down a tour and it's no problem <laughs> I can earn an action come home with something in my pocket for doing it yeah uh, I haven't got the energy now at this stage of my life to be scrimping I, I need things to work you know but I mean I need them to make sense on the on the sums or I quite frankly won't do it. Why would you? I'm not, I don't need experience and I don't need um, exposure. I don't need anything other than, you know, I've brought up my child, I've bought my instruments, I've paid for my albums, I've, you know, I've put a lot in. So not at the point where I'm, you know, coming away empty handed from working. Well, that's good. It's work. It's work. Yeah. <laughs> um. So are you planning on doing uh, any touring here soon? Oh, in the States? Yeah. No. States well, I haven't, no, because, well, I don't have a booking agent over there or anything like that. I don't have uh, the means to set it up at the moment. Um, I just, I just, ha after coming out of the coronavirus, I haven't, uh, I haven't gone anywhere yet. Yeah. I was, before, I was always touring, you know, my whole life I've been touring. 
but uh, I was a little bit concerned about the whole travel situation and I, I bought a truck and built a theatre. Uh, so I built a little venue, a little bow top on the back of a truck. Oh, okay. And then I'm touring in it in Ireland at the moment, but um, I'd love to go to America and do a tour. I would absolutely love that. That would be great. Um, I'm not ruling out anything. I would go totally go to America and play. I think they'd love, they love the harp. So um yeah and i've done it before i could do it again it'd be no problem yeah and especially um with the um summer coming up now i know we've got a lot of irish festivals coming up because we've got the cleveland irish festival and the dublin irish festival are uh, they in the, they're in the summertime they're in august are they yeah in august and july yeah july august yeah so, yeah well it could be too late for this year like a lot of the festivals would be They'd be, they'd have their their lineup sorted already. Especially, it's it 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 is more the for festivals and stuff. It is just more about getting there, you know, like because you've got all the um, you know, travel expenses and stuff. So, um, it's just about making it work, you know. So, um, but my, my also the the other reason why I haven't been in so long is because. Uh, my son is 18 and he's about to leave in September. He's going to go to England. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, he's grown up now, so he's he's going to go to college. But it means that I will be free to do some of the stuff I did before I had him. That's why I haven't been to America. I, like, I took him with me, with me a lot of the tours, a lot of the... He was on the road with me. I took him to, out of school, took him to Australia for three months. We'd take him to Edinburgh for big, long month runs of shows. And it was really hard to tour with a child. I just, I couldn't bring him, make it work to bring him to America, you know. So, um, but I did, I uh, needed support. I need somebody else to book the tour, basically, to, to do stuff like that. So, um, does your son play instruments? No. No. <laughs> he didn't no. take after mom. I tried. I tried, but I didn't want to be pushy. You know, like I wasn't a pushy parent. So if he says, I don't want to do that, I was like, okay, then let's do something else. So mm -hmm. I tried I'm making every instrument available to him. Even he played the tuba, he played the guitar, he played the piano, he played the what else? Oh, I don't know. He, he just hated it all and gave it all up. But I think I put him off, you know. I'd take him around to all the festivals and everything. And then eventually, when he was a teenager, I had to stop going to Edinburgh Festival because he wouldn't come with me. Aww. And then and then he was like, I was going, we're going to summer festivals and we're camping in Ireland. And he's like, Mum, seriously, see if there's not a hotel, tell it to the hand. <laughs> <laughs> he wouldn't come with me. I was like, well, I'll go on my own then. I know. <laughs> I, I was just, and then, uh, then he was disappearing and was driving back down the road to find him. He was when he's in his teenage phase, you know, it was really, it was really, that was the most challenging time to keep touring because he was, um, you know, he wouldn't come with me after a certain age and he'd had too much of it he'd been dragged around festivals since he was born and uh he he, he was done with it you know mm. so can i ask if you don't mind what's his major in college film oh okay he's, he's his dad's a film buff and his dad's into films so he's um He's gone in his dance footsteps, not mine. So it is a pity because he's he's my only child. I would have loved him to do music, obviously. But I wouldn't wish the life of a musician on anyone. And deep down, I'm sort of it's good that he's maybe gonna go get a bit more security than I've had. Yeah, I I'm sure definitely being a musician um can be very hard work especially when it comes to, you know, money and feeding yourself and paying the rent or the bills. Yeah, keeping it stable for a child, like you're out working the night, burning the midnight oil, and then he's up at six in the morning and you're, um, it's just, it's just that thing of the children need routine, like they're going to school and they've got exams and they need like, 
the, the strangest set of needs start happening all around you when you're a mummy and uh, you've got to keep it together and you've got to do it. So uh, that is hard when you're on tour in a different place, coming home late, you're exhausted. Like it's just, I honestly, I don't know how I did it. I don't know how I managed to tour all those years and managed to, and you know what? He's actually lovely and he's very well balanced and a, like a really nice person. It's like hard. How did you turn out so well? He's, he's gorgeous now. Oh, that's like, right. How did that happen? <laughs> From his, his very sort of bohemian upbringing. <laughs> it wasn't exactly very conventional, his 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 childhood. Uh, I'm sure there were some adventures. So. <laughs> well, he was, when, when I was doing an Edinburgh Festival, and they said, oh, you're a wee mini manager. And he was wearing as we, uh, he had a stand, like his comedy, he had an all access comedy pass for Edinburgh Festival. And there was, I'd, I'd had to go over to do the sound check and, and, or I can't remember the circumstances, but somehow a girl who didn't know Max ended up bringing him over to Edinburgh Festival to join me. And, and she was like, she sent me a message. I'm a bit nervous. I I've never been to Edinburgh. I don't know. Um, I'm a bit nervous. And I said to her, listen, so Max has the money. He knows where the state, the departure lounge is. When you get there, he knows how to get on the tram. He knows where the club is and he's got the pass to get you in. <laughs> and he brought her. <laughs> he was only nine or ten. <laughs> <laughs> and he also she said he also knew a great restaurant to have lunch she was like of course he did <laughs> oh wow so young and yet so yeah. young. he was always very capable you know he just he like he knew the way home from australia and i'm going ah, I, I i need another you know sometimes i just do, i i think it's because i'm dyslexic and you know i do manage to get to places but i do go through this the stress when I'm traveling and he doesn't have that he was just always got this very street he was sort of very streetwise you know he's, he's just very level-headed and understood everything whereas I understood very little uh, great so um for people that don't know um where can they find you in your website and everything yeah so there's a website uh UrsulaBurns.co.uk, and then my music's on Spotify and Bandcamp, and I've got a YouTube channel for videos. And they might be like, "What is going on here?" They're all different, you know. Like some of the music is music videos, or some of them, a well, lot's comedy. A lot of that's comedy. A lot of the comedy videos are on the website. Um, and I do the usual Instagram. I'm the Dangerous Harpist on Instagram and Facebook. Uh -huh. And uh, then um, what else do I have online? Patreon, I have a Patreon. Okay. But I just, I took a break from Patreon the last two months. Uh, we had another bereavement in my family last week. So I'm so um, sorry. I know it's been hard. My, and I was very close. It was uh, my auntie, my mom's sister. So like I've got her, her picture here beside me. She, she was just so beautiful and, oh, she is you know, she, her funeral was, was last week. Well, so. like what? You have yeah, her. I'm very like her. I'm like her. And uh, in, in, uh, this is like a frequency as well. Not just looks. There's, we, we have a similar, we were very, uh, we were very close. So I can't remember why I started saying that. I was probably to do with can't remember what you asked me but uh we were close and uh, yeah so I stopped I took a month or two out of my Patreon because I she was at the end and I was trying to do my live gigs and I was working last night you know it's been it's been very it's very hard when you're self-employed and you've got something like that going on that's um it's been it's the last few weeks have been really hard yeah, I'm, so I'm not updating it at the minute. I'm just taking a month or two off, and then I'm going to go back to it with fresh energy because I just I needed I needed time out to process it, and 
I'm honoring all my live gigs, but I just had to pull back on what I did online um, just for a couple of months and then I'll, I'll open it up again. It's still there. It's, the Patreon is still there. Mm -hmm. um, it's just before then I was putting a lot of content up with snatch three videos as I'm going about my gigs and my life and, uh, and uh, that lovely wee group of people there. So. Um, do you have music videos and everything? Yeah. yeah, yeah, but they're all like rickety slap. You know, I don't have big budget stuff. Um, so uh, you'll find them on the website. If you look at the website, you'll see that oh, they're on the YouTube, YouTube channel. Okay. I run each each site differently. Like Ursula Burns Music is literally a catalog. Here's where I'm playing. And then Instagram is more about the truck and the mobile venue. I've, I've got this sweet truck and I built the venue. <laughs> and it's more about that. And then the uh, Patreon is more like uh, behind the scenes and lots of videos. And uh, yes, yeah, so I run, I just have different relationship with each platform really. Okay. And then Spotify and Bandcamp are albums and back catalog. Okay. And um, real quick, were you able to break down um, the stereotype of the harpist? Mostly in comedy. Comedy's where I've landed. It's the last eight years and uh, people, it's, it's really good as well. Some people book me to be the harpist in the corner and then start doing my own material. Um, and the, the, the comedy stuff, the, the songwriting is, uh, I've just sort of not in that mode at the moment. Um, I am writing a children's show. Okay. The Blue, Ro the Blue Rose. And I, on that, I play one hand on the piano and one hand on the harp. Oh, wow. Yeah, <laughs> I tell the uh, I tell the story through song, so that's been a big piece of work, and that's taken me ages. And actually, I took it out in the truck the last few months and found it really quite challenging. Um, so I'm just going back to the drawing board with that. That might be better in a theatre with the company. So that would be um, that. But the the very very easy thing for me to do is rock up and make people laugh, like sing songs, and make people laugh, and. And uh, I enjoy that. And uh, then I also do for uh, when I'm, I also do the, oh, the harpist playing in the corner, charge money for that. And I do that. And that's, that's all. I also really enjoy that because you're, you're creating a beautiful atmosphere. It's just like the harp just creates a nice atmosphere. So I really enjoy going to places and I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy as long as the lines are defined. I'm either doing the background music or else. And I've got them and I'm making them laugh and they're mine and they're an audience and they're molded like putty and I get every person in the room know how to do it now and they're not getting let go until I finished and then that's it. it's a show comedy show you know it's different I've, I'm very very happy doing background and upfront stuff as long as it's def it's defined in the booking you know uh, you learn over time to get to get the, just do the right thing in the right place at the right time. <laughs> okay. Thank you so very much, Ursula, for the interview. I appreciate